At the time when materialism flourished, chiefly as a theory, that is, in the middle and later decades of the 19th century, when works such as those of Büchner or Vogt, then known as Fat Vogt, made a great impression on large circles of those who considered themselves to be enlightened people, a certain way of speaking was often heard, a way still heard today, for in certain spheres of thought we still find the stragglers of that theoretical materialism. When such people do not wish to deny every sort of life after death, when they wish occasionally to admit this life after death, they say, quote, well, there may be such a life after death, but why should we trouble about it here on in earthly life? When death has taken place, we shall see whether there is such a life, and if we occupy ourselves only with what the earth provides and pay no further attention to what comes after death, we cannot miss much, for whatever the life after death may bring us, we shall see then. Close quote. As already remarked, this way of speaking was often heard, and can still be heard to a great extent, and when it is thus expressed it might almost seem to be admissible. Yet it absolutely contradicts the facts accessible to spiritual investigation, when the facts which take place in the life between death and rebirth are observed spiritually. When man has passed through the portal of death, he comes in contact with various forces and beings. Man not only lives in a world of spiritual facts, but he comes in touch with certain forces, with beings indeed whom we have often mentioned as the beings of the various higher hierarchies. Let us now inquire into what it means for man to come in touch with these forces and, bring, and beings of the higher hierarchies on his way through the life between death and rebirth. We know that when man has passed through that life in the supersensible world and re-enters existence through a new birth, he is in a certain way the builder of his own body, and indeed of his whole destiny in his next life. <clears throat> Within certain limits man forms and constructs his body, even to the convolutions of his brain, with the forces he brings with him from the spiritual world, when at birth he re-enters physical existence. Our whole life here depends upon our having organs in our physical body, through which we may come in touch with the world outside, around us, and through which we may act and also think in this outer physical world. For if we do not possess a suitably formed brain, which on passing through birth we form out of the forces of the supersensible world, we are unfitted for life in the physical world. We are only properly fitted for this life when we bring with us from the spiritual world forces by means of which we are able to construct a body adapted to the requirements of the physical world. We receive the supersensible forces we require in order to work upon our body and also our destiny from the beings and forces of the higher hierarchies with which we are connected between death and rebirth. Therefore we must receive what is necessary for the upbuilding of our body and our destiny during the period between our last death and our present birth. Between death and rebirth, we have to approach, step by step, as it were, the several beings who are able to give us the forces necessary for us when we re-enter physical existence. Now, during life between death and rebirth, we may pass by the beings of the higher hierarchies in two ways. We may pass them by in such a way that we know them, that we understand their nature and their qualities of character and are able to receive what they have the power to give us. For it is a case of receiving from the higher hierarchies that which they are able to give us and which we then use in the following life. As regards what is to be given, we must be in a position to understand, or at least to see, when one thing or another is handed to us, which we are then able to use. For we might pass these beings by in such a way that speaking pictorially, though they stretch out their hands containing the gifts we need for our life, we do not take them, because it is dark in that higher world through which we are then passing. Thus we may pass through that world with understanding, so that we are aware of what is to be given us by those beings, 
or we may pass through it without understanding and unaware of what they wish to give us. Now, which of these two ways we necessarily have to choose for our journey between death and rebirth is determined by the after-effects of the preceding earthly lives. A person who in his last earthly life remains dull and apathetic toward all the thoughts and ideas which come to us in explanation of the supersensible world passes as if in darkness through the life between death and rebirth. Spiritually speaking, the light which we have need of in order to know how these beings approach us in order to know what gifts we ought to receive from one or another of them for our next life, the light of understanding we cannot gain in the supersensible world, but must gain it here during physical earthly incarnation. We pass through supersensible life as far as to our next birth, so that we pass by everything, know nothing, and receive nowhere the forces necessary for our next life on earth. If at death we do not carry with us some ideas and conceptions into the spiritual life. From this we see how impossible it is to say that we can delay until death takes place and that we can then see what facts or if any reality at all meets us after death. The manner in which we come in touch with this reality depends upon our attitude in earthly life whether we have accepted or rejected the ideas regarding the supersensible world which we might have received, and which must be the light which illumines our path between death and rebirth. Another thing may be gathered from what has been said. The belief that one need only die in order to receive all that the supersensible world can give, even although one has neglected to prepare for it here, is entirely wrong. Every world has its particular mission, and what man can gain in his earthly embodiment he can acquire in no other world. Between death and rebirth, under all circumstances, man meets with beings of the higher hierarchies, but in order to receive their gifts, in order not to grope in darkness or at any rate in dreadful solitude through that life, in order to be able to contact the higher hierarchies and their forces, he must acquire during earthly life the conceptions and ideas which are the light by which he is able to see the higher hierarchies. Therefore one who in our present era has disdained the acquisition of spiritual conceptions on earth passes through life between death and rebirth as if in dreadful solitude, and dreadful solitude as regards the higher life means to grope in darkness and he does not bring with him into his next life the forces which ought to build up his body and construct his instruments in the proper manner. He can only build them up in an imperfect form, and therefore in his next life he will be an insufficient human being. We see from this how karma works from one life to the next. In one life a person voluntarily disdains all knowledge of the spiritual worlds. In the next life, he does not possess the forces with which to create the organs by means of which he could think, feel, and will the truths of spiritual life. He then remains dull and inattentive to spiritual things, and goes through life as if in a dream, as is the case with so many people. While on earth he betrays no interest in the things of the spiritual world, and when such a soul as this passes at length through the portal of death, it falls a prey to the Luciferic powers. Lucifer then approaches this soul, and it is characteristic of the life in the spiritual world that following upon a dull and inattentive one in the physical world, the beings and facts of the higher hierarchies are indeed illuminated for such a person, not, however, by what he acquired in earthly life, but by the light which Lucifer instills into his soul. It is Lucifer who now illuminates for him the higher world through which he passes in his life between death and rebirth. He can indeed perceive the higher hierarchies and see when they wish to give him forces, but through Lucifer having tainted the light by which he sees them, 
it gives them a particular shade, a particular color, which modifies all the gifts in a special way. The forces of the higher hierarchies are not then in a form in which he might otherwise have received them, but they are, are of such a nature that when he enters into his next life he can indeed form and shape his body, but he shapes it in such a way that he becomes a person adapted to the external world and its requirements, one who in a certain respect is inwardly inadequate because his soul is filled and colored with luciferic gifts, or at least with gifts tinged by Lucifer. When we meet with people in life who have worked upon their body in such a way that they can use their intellect well, when they have acquired a certain ability through which they rise high in life, yet do this only to their own advantage, when they use their gifts only to obtain what is important for themselves and their existence, and have their own advantage in view regardless of others, the seer frequently finds that their previous history has been what we have just described. Before they came to this dryly intellectual and clever life, they had been led by luciferic beings through the world which lies between death and rebirth, and these beings were able to approach them because in their previous incarnation they had passed through life in a dull, dreamy way. They acquired this dull and dreamy way of life because previously they had gone through the life between death and rebirth, groping their way in darkness through a life in which the spirits of the higher hierarchies ought to have given them the forces wherewith to build up a new life, but which they were unable to receive properly. They had come about because previ this had come about because previously they had voluntarily refused to occupy themselves with ideas and conceptions regarding spiritual worlds. Here you have the karmic connection. The things we have just described are multiplied in proportion to the facts which have appeared in the historical development of humanity. They appear only too often when, with the help of spiritual investigation, we penetrate the higher worlds and learn the conditions of human life which then rise before our spiritual eyes. How mistaken it is, therefore, to say that we need only trouble ourselves about what surrounds us in earthly existence, that what comes after will appear later. In what, may, in what way it will appear depends entirely upon how we have prepared for it here. Another thing may also come about quite easily, and I am telling you of these things in order that through our understanding of the life between death and rebirth, this, may, this life may at the same time become more and more comprehensible. When we observe earthly life with understanding, we find in it many people, and particularly in our age we find them very, very frequently, who in a certain way are only half able to think, whose logic halts in face of reality. We will give an example. On one occasion a broad-minded minister, who in other respects was perfectly honest in his efforts, wrote in the first quote, free thinker's calendar, close quote, the following, quote, one ought not to impart religious ideas to children, for this would be unnatural. When children are allowed to grow up without being crammed with religious ideas, we find that of themselves they do not arrive at ideas of God, of immortality, etc. From this it can be seen that such ideas are unnatural to man, and one should not impart to him anything that is unnatural, but only what may be drawn forth from his own soul. Close quote. A statement such as this may seem to be very clever, and very keen-sighted to thousands of people at the present time. But if we apply true logic to it, we find the following. Suppose we take a human being who has not yet learned to speak, set him on a lonely island, and take care that he hears none of the sounds of speech. The consequence will be that he never learns to talk. Those who say that we ought not to impart any religious ideas to children must allow, logically, that they also ought not to learn to talk, for language does not come of itself. Our liberal-minded minister cannot, therefore, further the idea we have mentioned through his logic, for his logic fails in face of facts, and he does not notice that if one grasps the idea at all, it annuls itself. 
When we look around in the world, we find that this insufficient half-thinking is very widespread. When, with the aid of supersensible research, we trace the path taken by such a person backward and arrive at the regions through which his soul lived between his last death and his present birth, where he acquired this illogical method of thought, the seer often finds that in his last life, between death and rebirth, such a person had passed through the spiritual world so that he was under the guidance of Araman. He approached the higher spiritual beings and forces which should have given him what he needed for this life. But they could not give him the power to develop himself so that he could think properly. Araman was his leader, and Araman contrived that he should only receive the gifts of the beings and forces of the higher hierarchies in such a way that in life his thinking would be of no use in face of actual facts, and that he could never fashion his thought so that it should be correct and complete in itself. A great number of those who are unable to think at the present time, and their number is legion, owe this to the fact that in their last life between death and rebirth they were obliged to allow Araman to accompany them because they had, to a certain extent, adapted themselves for this through their last earthly life. What was the course of that earthly life when we follow it with a seer's vision? We find that such people were hypochondriacal, that they surely did not wish to enter the world of facts and beings. It was always, in a certain sense, inconvenient for them to be connected in any way with the surrounding world. Such people frequently were unbearable hypochondriacs, in their previous life. If you were to investigate their physical body of that life, you would find physical diseases that are very frequently met with in hypochondriacal people. And if we go back still further to the previous life between death and re-embodiment, namely that which preceded the, the hypochondriacal life, we find that at that time those people lacked the guidance which would have enabled them to perceive what gifts the higher hierarchies should have had for them. How did these people prepare this for themselves in the life before last, here upon earth? They prepared it by developing what may be called a religious frame of mind, but only from egoism. They were people who were pious, perhaps even had mystical natures, but only from egoism. For very frequently mysticism is developed out of egoism in such a way that a person says, quote, I seek within in order to know God in my inner being. Close quote. And if we go further into what he seeks, we find it is only his own self which he makes into God. With many pious souls we find that they are only pious in order that after death they may have a certain spiritual frame of mind. What they have prepared in this way is an egoistic attitude. When, with the aid of spiritual research, we follow such a person through three earthly lives, we find in the first of the three lives an egoistic mysticism, an egoistic religion as the fundamental feeling in the soul. And when today we observe people who behave in life in the manner described, we can trace them back by spiritual research to times when there were numbers of souls who developed a religious frame of mind out of pure egoism. They then passed through an existence between death and rebirth in which they were powerless to receive from spiritual beings the gifts which ought to have shaped their next life properly. This next life developed as a morose, hypochondriacal one in which everything was contrary. Through this they again prepared themselves to receive Araman and his hosts as their leaders when they passed once more through the portal of death and they then received forces whereby, in the following earthly life, they manifested defective logic and short-sighted dull thought. Thus we have another case of three consecutive incarnations. We see again and again how foolish it is to believe that we may wait until death approaches us before troubling ourselves about the supersensible world. Our relationship to the supersensible world after death depends upon the inner tendencies and interests we have acquired here toward that world. 
Not only are consecutive earthly lives connected like causes and effects, but our lives here between birth and death and those between death and rebirth are in a certain respect also connected like causes and effects. This can be seen from what follows. When the seer directs his gaze up to the supersensible world where souls live after death, he finds some who in a certain part of this life between death and rebirth are servants of the powers which may be called the lords of all healthy, vigorous life on earth. In this long period between death and rebirth, many experiences are gone through, and in these descriptions only parts can be dealt with. Among those who have died, we find some who for a certain time cooperate in the supersensible world in the wonderful task, for it is a wonderful task, of pouring into the physical world all that contributes to the health of beings on earth, all that can make them bloom and thrive. Just as under certain circumstances we may become servants of the evil powers of disease and misfortune, we may also become servants of those spiritual beings who bring about health and growth, who from the spiritual world send forces into our world which cause life to flourish. For it is a materialistic superstition that physical hygiene and external arrangements alone contribute to health. All that happens in physical life is governed by the beings and powers of the higher worlds. These are continually sending their forces into the physical world, forces which work freely in a certain way, either as forces bringing health to man and other beings, or as forces injurious to health and growth. Certain spiritual powers and beings guide these processes of health and disease. Man becomes a fellow worker with these powers during life between death and rebirth, and if we have prepared ourselves in the right way, we may enjoy the bliss of cooperating in pouring down from the higher world's health and life-giving forces into this world. When the seer inquires as to how such souls have deserved this, he observes that in physical earthly life people may think and do things they wish to do in two ways. Let us consider human life. We see numbers of people who do the work prescribed for them by their profession or by one thing or another. And although the radical case may not occur, where the attitude of these people toward their work is like that of an animal being led to the slaughter, it may be said that they work because they are obliged to, and they never neglect their duty. This may be so. In a certain sense it cannot be otherwise in the present cycle of humanity. And in cases where man has no other motive than what duty demands. This does not mean to say that work done from duty is to be adversely criticized. It should not be understood thus. Earthly evolution is of such a nature that precisely this aspect of life is spreading more and more, and this will not improve as time goes on. The things people will have to do will become more and more complicated insofar as they concern external life, and people will be condemned more and more to think and do only what they are driven to by duty. Even now we find that there are some who only do their work because they are driven by duty, and on the other hand, there are others who will look for a society such as ours where they can also do something, not from an external feeling of duty, as in outer life, but something for which they can feel devotion and enthusiasm. We may observe whether it is a work of thought or external activity which is done from duty, or one which is done with enthusiasm, with devotion from the innermost impulse of the soul, to which nothing drives but the soul itself. This attitude of the soul to think and act not merely from duty but from love, from inclination and devotion, prepares the soul to become a servant of the good powers of health and of all the health-giving forces sent down from the supersensible world to our physical world. To prepare the soul to become a servant of all that brings health and flourishing life and to feel the bliss which accompanies this. It is extremely important for the total life of man that he should know this, 
for only by acquiring forces in life that enable him to come in contact with the powers in question can he cooperate spiritually in giving ever-increasing health and life to all on the earth. We shall now consider another case. Let us imagine a person who tries to fit himself into his environment and its requirements. This is not the case with everyone. There are some who make no effort to attune themselves to the world. There are people who cannot attune themselves to the conditions either of spiritual life or bodily life. Thus, for example, there are people who read on the placards that there will be an ethroposophical lecture at a certain place. They go, and they have scarcely sat down before they are asleep. Their soul cannot fit itself into the environment. It does not agree with it. I have known men who could not sew a button on for themselves. That means that they could not adapt themselves to outer physical conditions. We might give thousands and thousands of cases of good or bad adaptation to life. I have already said that a great deal depends upon such things. For the present we need only mention what depends upon them in the life between death and rebirth. Everything is cause, and from everything proceeds effects. A person who tries to adapt himself to his environment, who can sew a button on for himself, or listen to something to which he is unaccustomed, so that he does not at once go to sleep, <clears throat> prepares himself to become a fellow worker after death, a helper of those spirits who assist human progress, who send to the earth the spiritual powers and forces which further human progress, and the life which progresses from age to age. We can only acquire the bliss of looking down after death upon earthly life and seeing how it progresses, and of working with the forces which are continually being sent down to earth to further its progress, if we make efforts here to fit in with earthly conditions and adapt ourselves to our environment. We can only understand karma in a truly comprehensive way when we are able to observe it in detail. In those, in those details which reveal the various ways in which cause and effect are connected here in the physical world, in the spiritual world, and in the whole of existence. This throws light also upon the fact that our life in the spiritual worlds depends upon how we live in the physical body. As we have already said, all worlds have their own particular mission. No two worlds have the same mission. What are the characteristic phenomena and characteristic experiences in one world are not the characteristic phenomena and experiences of another world. If a being, for example, is to receive certain things which it can only receive on earth, it must receive them there, and if it neglects this, it cannot receive them in another world. This can be seen with great clearness in a matter we have already touched on but it is well to inscribe it deeply in our minds. It can be seen in the reception given to certain conceptions and ideas which man needs for his whole life. Let us take an example which concerns us closely, namely that of spiritual science or anthroposophy, which is justified and is active in our age. People acquire anthroposophy first by living on the earth, by coming to it in the manner known to you, and by accepting it. Now, it might easily be thought that it is unnecessary to study anthroposophy here on the earth, but that a person will be able to learn what it is like in the spiritual worlds when he has passed through the portal of death, and that there will also be spiritual teachers in the higher hierarchies who will bring these things before the soul. Now, it is a fact that after the various developments which the human soul has passed through up to the present cycle of humanity, Preparation is now being made on earth for it to approach that kind of anthroposophical life which can only be approached when it is dwelling in a physical body and living a physical life. Man is predestined to approach anthroposophy, and if he does not do so, he is unable to connect himself with any spiritual being who can teach it to him. One cannot simply die and then after death find a teacher who can replace what can come to souls here in earthly life as anthroposophy. We need not be sad because we see that many people scorn anthroposophy 
and we must now presume they cannot acquire it between death and rebirth. We need not be despondent, because these people will be born into a new earthly life, and there will then be enough anthroposophy on the earth so that they may acquire it then. Despondency is at present out of place. But this should not cause anyone to say, quote, I can take up anthroposophy in my next life. I need not trouble about it now. Close quote. No, what is neglected now cannot be made up later. At the very beginning of our anthroposophical movement here, I once spoke about certain matters concerning the higher worlds in a lecture on Nietzsche. At the conclusion of the lecture, a discussion took place and someone said, quote, A matter such as this must always be tested by Kant's philosophy. And we then find that all these things cannot be known here, for we can only know about them when we have died. Quote. These actual words were said. Now, it is not the case that we merely have to die in order to experience certain things. <clears throat> when a person goes through the portal of death, he does not experience things for which he has made no preparation. The life between death and rebirth is absolutely a continuation of the life here, as can be seen from the various examples which have already been given. Therefore, as human beings, we can only obtain from the beings of the higher hierarchies after death what we may obtain by having prepared ourselves for it here on the earth. Our connection with the earth and our passage through earthly life has a purpose which can be replaced by nothing else. One kind of meditation can, however, take place in this connection. A person may die, and during his earthly life he may not have known anthroposophy, but his brother, his wife, or a close friend is perhaps an anthroposophist. The person who has died has refused during life to have anything to do with anthroposophy. He may perhaps have abused it. He then passes through the portal of death, and can now be made acquainted with anthroposophy through other people on the earth. But in this case there must be someone on earth who gives it to the other out of love, so that here again the connection with the earth is preserved. Upon this rests what I have called reading to the dead. <clears throat> we can do them a great service by this, even though previously they wished to know nothing about the spiritual world. We can do it either in the form of thoughts, instructing the dead in this manner, or we may take an anthroposophical book or something similar, picture those who have died, and read to them. The dead can then perceive it. We have had great and beautiful examples of what may be bestowed upon the dead in our anthroposophical movement in this way. Many of our friends read thus to their departed ones. One may also have the experience which came to me recently. I was asked about one who had died, because he made his presence felt by all sorts of signs particularly during the night, by disquietude in the room, rattling, etc. From this it may often be concluded that the departed wants something. In this case it did actually prove that the departed one was longing for something. During his life he had been a learned man, but had rejected all that came to him as knowledge of the spiritual world. His friends now realized that a great service would be done him if a certain course of lectures were read to him, because the things he thirsted for are discussed in it. In this extremely important way, a remedy which extends beyond death can be provided for something which has been neglected on earth. Such experiences bring home to us the great and important mission of anthroposophy, that anthroposophy will bridge the gulf between the living and the dead, so that when people die it will not be as if they went away from us, but we shall still be connected with them and be able to do something for them. Should anyone inquire if we always know whether the departed hears us, we must reply that those who do this devotedly will really notice, after a time, from the way in which the thoughts which they read to the dead exist in their own soul, that the departed one is near them. This, however, is a feeling which can only be perceived by sensitive souls. The worst thing that can happen in such a case, which may be a great labor of love, is that it is not listened to. It, is, it has then been done to no purpose, but then perhaps it has had some other significance in the order of the world. <coughs> One ought not to trouble too much about such a lack of success, 
for it often happens that something is read here to a number of people and neither do they listen to one. These things may bring the seriousness and value of anthroposophy into the right light. But we must continually emphasize the fact that the way we shall live in the spiritual world after death will depend entirely upon the manner in which we have lived here upon the earth. Social life with other human beings in the spiritual world will also depend upon the kind of relationship we have fo tried to form with them here. In the other world we cannot, without more ado, make a connection with a person with whom we had no connection here. The possibility of being brought to him, of being with him in the spiritual world, is acquired as a rule through the connections made here on earth. Not, however, merely through those made in the last incarnation, but also in former ones. In short, actual and personal relationships which we have made on earth determine our life between death and rebirth. There are, of course, exceptional cases. If you remember what I said here on Christmas Eve about Buddha and his present mission on Mars, you have one of these exceptional cases in the figure of Buddha. There are numbers of souls on earth who have confronted Buddha personally in the inspiration of the mysteries, and also previously in his existence as Bodhisattva. But because Buddha went through his last earthly incarnation as the son of Sotadana, and that which I have described, and has now transferred his activity to Mars, it has become possible even though we may not previously have met him, to come into relationship with him in our life between death and rebirth, and to bring the result of this relationship down with us again into our next earthly incarnation. This, however, is the exception. As a rule, after death, we find those human beings with whom we have set up relationships and connections here. And we continue these relationships and connections after death. The explanations connected with what has been said in this winter's lectures concerning the life between death and rebirth are given with the object in view of showing that anthroposophy is incomplete if it only remains a theory or an external science, and that it only becomes what it ought to be when it pervades souls like an elixir of life, so that they fully realize the feelings which come to a man when he becomes acquainted with the things of the higher world. Death, then, does not approach man as something which destroys personal human relationships. The gulf between the life here on earth and the life after death is bridged. In the future many activities will develop which will be carried out from this point of view. The dead will work over into life, the living into the kingdom of the dead. I should like you to reflect upon how much richer, fuller, and more spiritual life will be when this really comes about through anthroposophy. Only those who can feel anthroposophy in this way have the right feeling toward it. The principal thing for us is not the knowledge that man consists of physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego, that he passes through various incarnations, that the earth in the course of its existence has gone through the Saturn, Sun, and Moon incarnations, to know this is not the principal thing. The important and essential thing is that through anthroposophy we should be able to change our life in the manner required by the future of the earth. <coughs> we cannot feel this often enough, and we cannot too often reflect upon it. For the feelings we take with us from our gathering under the stimulus of the knowledge of the supersensible world, and which we then carry with us through life, are the important things in anthroposophical life. Hence it is not sufficient in anthroposophy merely to know, but that we know with feeling, and feel with knowledge, that our knowledge be accompanied by feeling and our feeling by knowledge. We must understand how wrong it is to think that without knowing something of the world we can do justice to it. Leonardo da Vinci's statement is true, quote, Great love is the daughter of great knowledge, close quote. He who does not want to know does not, in the true sense, learn to love. <coughs> Anthroposophy ought to be received into our souls in this sense, so that through it influences proceeding from us may start a movement in the evolution of the earth which shall grow stronger and stronger, 
a spiritual movement which will bring spiritual things and material things into harmony. Then the time will come when though people will indeed still live materially on the earth and outer earthly life will grow more and more material, man will walk the earth yet be connected in soul with the higher world. Outwardly earthly life will grow more and more material. That is its karma. But to the extent that outward earthly life becomes more material, souls must become more and more inwardly spiritual if the evolution of the earth is to reach its goal. This lecture is intended as a small contribution toward the way in which this task may be accomplished.